Thank you very much. It's good to be back. The uh, very first Ig Nobel ceremonies were held at MIT, which you may not know. The first one was in the MIT Museum, and the next three years were here in this very room. So thank you for continuing this tradition. And I look forward to giving Ig Nobel Prizes to three people who are in this room, but you don't yet know who you are. <laughs> Nor do I. I want to talk to you tonight about one of the greatest scientific triumphs ever made. Uh, you may not consider it to be so, but um, I'm presenting it as such, and so you can take it that way. I want to talk to you about the psychological tips of top leaders. There is an acknowledged hierarchy in most of the world of which are the most respected sciences. Uh, physics and math are usually regarded as being at the top, chemistry, biology, um, and then all the way down. And in a lot of people's view, the social sciences, so-called, are not even sciences, and so would be off the bottom of the scale. But I think in one important way, this is backwards. And that important way is in order of difficulty. When you consider what is the most difficult problem to solve, it's probably understanding anything at all about how human beings behave. All right, now, it's an open question as to whether anybody has actually made any progress whatsoever on that. <laughs> and I want to give you a very brief look at the uh, tip of that progress such as it is. And that is why I want to talk about the psychological tips of top leaders. We all have had to uh, deal with many respected leaders, and we all respect their leadership and their judgment, and I want to tell you how their judgment got to be the way it is. Psychology, the entire field of psychology, has had three great insights about leadership. And they're peculiar in the sense they were not always regarded as serious at the moment that they were made, but over time people realized these were both sort of funny but also really insightful. The first of them is called the Peter Principle. <laughs> this was devised by a man named Lawrence J. Peter in the 1960s. He published a book called The Peter Principle. Um, anybody here read this book? Okay. Or maybe seen this book? And the Peter Principle is quite a simple thing. Many people took it as a joke, but anybody who had had to live within a large organization saw that there's more than a joke here. The idea of the Peter Principle is this, that in any hierarchy, everybody tends to rise to the level of their own incompetence. <laughs> we gave an Ig Nobel Prize a few years ago to some physicists who built on this principle. And they modeled it. They're good at making models. They modeled what happened within any large organization over time. And they discovered that any organization will behave better, almost no matter how you measure better, if instead of promoting people according to who you think is best or most deserving, you promote people at random. Many of you are very good at doing models. You can model this for yourself and see whether you agree with this, but I bet you will. All right, that was one of the great insights. The next one is called Parkinson's Law. It too appeared in the form of a book, sort of funny, and then people realized it's not just funny. It was devised by a man named C. Northcote Parkinson, and apparently that was his name. His insight was something also simple to state, that work <laughs> expands to fill the time available for its completion. Right. And I can try to demonstrate that to you by mentioning to you that Zach asked me to come and give a speech. He asked me to write a short <laughs> speech and you're hearing it. The third of these great insights is something that also was awarded an Ig Nobel Prize. People thought it was just funny at the time. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. <laughs> Dunning and Kruger are psychologists. They were at Cornell at the time they did this. It was 1999 they published this paper. 
And the best way to summarize their main finding is simply to read to you the title of their paper. This was published in a psychology journal. The paper is called Unskilled and Unaware of It, How Difficulties in Recognizing One's Own Incompetence Lead to Inflated Self-Assessments. <laughs> Let me read that to you again. Unskilled and unaware of it. How difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence lead to inflated self-assessments. <laughs> the world in general really did treat all of these three insights as amusements. But more and more, all three of them are being seen as tremendous insights and insights that could be valuable even in the sense of uh, a business uh, usage. Um, now, this also was true in the field of academic psychology. The science of psychology, and there are many people who have no hesitation in using that phrase, the science of psychology, and because they have no hesitation, I will use that phrase. And I urge you, just for the sake of getting it out of the pit of your stomach, if you could say that phrase now, the science of psychology. <laughs> you never have to say it again in your life. <laughs> the science of psychology, and I mean the world of academic psychology, um, this is the world where things are debated, dissected, devoured in search of the atoms of human psychology. And the search doesn't stop there in search of the atoms of human psychology. They also in, are in search of the subatomic particles of human psychology. And it doesn't stop there. They're also in search of the string theory of human psychology. Uh, they are also in search of the many worlds theory of human psychology. Uh, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the Copenhagen interpretation of human psychology, as well as the Bernoulli principle of human psychology as modified by the theory of Hawking radiation from black holes. And I should not fail to mention the uh, Bose-Einstein cognitive condensates. <laughs> However, even, even in the world of academic psychology, these things have been largely taken as insights. And it took the business world to make sense of this stuff, to see the true value of these great psychological discoveries. And it took executives. Executives are busy, busy CEOs in corporations around the world. They have no time for amusements. They saw nothing funny in this. Um, busy CEOs are all about being busy. That's their business, busyness. They are busy. That's all they do. They uh, have needs. Believe it or not, CEOs have needs. And what they need, they will tell you, is information. CEOs need information. Uh, you can get information from many places. You can get it from books. You can get lots of information from books. But CEOs have no time to read books. And so, because they have no time to read books, there was born an industry that was called the condensed books industry. Uh, now, have any of you run across these books? If you look around, there's still plenty in old bookshops and all. A lot of them grew out of, probably all of them grew out of Reader's Digest, which was a little digest of condensed articles. And they would publish very short versions of books. Somebody turned this into an entire industry. And for decades, at, at, at conferences of business leaders, there would be a company there offering these condensed books, very short versions, 15, 20 pages of a 400 or 800 page book. And they would mark them way up. They were very expensive. And they were very successful because executives have no time to read books, but they could read the condensed versions of these books. Um, some insights arise from this condensation, from taking all of the arguments and boiling them down to essentially three words. And the condensed version books of these three great insights I told you turned out to be the great insights that led America and the world to our current state, led our leaders to understand everything they think they understand. They saw these as instruction manuals, whereas other people, the people who wrote them, saw them as largely amusements and insights. These business CEOs saw them as 
straightforward instruction manuals. You've all seen instruction manuals. They tell you what to do, and you just, you don't have to think about it. You just follow the instructions, and that's what happened in the business world. Uh, here is how these three great insights, the Peter Principle, Parkinson's Law, and uh, the unskilled and unaware of it um, insights of the Dunning-Kruger effect got translated into what business ex executives could and did and do use. The Peter Principle version, um, remember the Peter Principle is people rise to their own levels of incompetence. That was entreated as, uh, interpreted as people should rise to their level of incompetence. The uh, Parkinson's Law, which was work expands uh, to fill the time available for its completion, was interpreted as work should expand to fill the time available. And the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I'll remind you is called unskilled and unaware of it, how difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence lead to inflated self-assessments. That got turned into a series of simple instructions which were followed by nearly every CEO in the world. Those instructions are people should be unskilled. People should be unaware of it. People should have difficulties in recognizing their own incompetence. And people should have inflated self-assessments. If you follow the news these days, you know that these dictums are being followed faithfully. Uh, it explains all of this, this compression, these instructions, these things interpreted as instructions. It explains pretty much all of academic psychology. It explains pretty much all of what CEOs do in the business world. It explains what happens to the book industry. And it explains why we're here today in this world with our current leaders. Thank you. <laughs>